Well, this evening, we're going to uh, look at John chapter 1 uh, in verse 14. But again, because the kind of things we've been looking at are primarily topical, we're certainly not going to dwell just uh, on this, but we're going to look at a number of passages uh, uh, dealing with the theme. Uh, And again, the idea of drawing the parallel between the tabernacle in the wilderness in which the Lord dwelt and the tabernacle he set up in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, what I'd like to do is begin by reading John chapter 1, verses 1 through 18. This is what we read. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through him, and apart from him nothing came into being that has come into being. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. There came a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify about the light so that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but he came to testify about the light. There was the true light, which coming into the world enlightens every man. He was in the world. And the world was made through him, and the world did not know him. He came to his own, and those who were his own did not receive him. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, even to those who believe in his name, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, And we saw his glory, glory as of the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. John testified about him and cried out, saying, This was he of whom I said, He who comes after me has a higher rank than I, for he existed before me. For of his fullness we have all received, in grace upon grace. For the law was given through Moses, grace and truth were realized through Jesus Christ." No one has seen God at any time, the only begotten God who is in the bosom of the Father. He has explained him. May the Lord bless his uh, word to our understanding uh, this evening. Now, this morning, uh, I've already mentioned, we saw how Isaiah was brought into the presence of God where he saw the revelation of God's glory and he saw his holiness. Uh, Basically, the Lord brought him near. Now, what Isaiah saw frightened him. He understood when he saw the Lord exactly what kind of a man he was, exactly how uh, sinful he really is. He says in Isaiah 6, 5, I am a man of unclean lips. At the same time, he understood what that meant and how much God hated sin what that meant for him. He says also in verse 5, Woe is me, for I am ruined. He realized because of his sin he was under the Lord's curse. But we also uh, saw from this morning that Isaiah at the same time came to understand more of God's mercy and his grace because when he confessed his sin, the Lord commanded an angel uh, who flew from the altar with a burning coal, touched his lips, and took away his sins. And we noted he was cleansed, uh, not by some arbitrary act of God, but by something that was symbolic of that work of the Lord Jesus Christ, was, which was yet in the future. He was cleansed by the same sacrifice that takes away our sins, and that is the blood of Jesus. Uh, one thing I believe we also noted was that by this cleansing, by this humbling, he was also better equipped to serve the Lord in that work that he had called him to do. So essentially, this is what we saw. God brought Isaiah near. When he was in the presence of God, there was a crisis of holiness. God is holy, but he was not. And then we saw how the Lord resolved that crisis uh, through this atoning act. Now, this was an Old Testament picture, really, of the work of our Lord Jesus Christ. The Father sent his Son into the world to cleanse us of our sins, to resolve our crisis of holiness so that we too might serve him 
but that we also might live with him uh, forever. Now, this evening, I'd like for us to consider some of the ways that the Lord pointed to these truths in the Old Testament and how he fulfilled them in the Lord Jesus. And I do want us to organize the study around those three themes that I already told you about that we noted when we looked at the book of Leviticus. And we'll, we'll simply express them in this way. God's desire, and really that's behind all of this, isn't it? God's desire. He wanted to be with us, and that is infinite mercy. Uh, secondly, what it is that prevented this, uh, this union, as it were, and that is the crisis of holiness. God is holy, but we are not holy. And then we want to see, of course, His solution, that the Lord provided a way for us to be reconciled, that we might become holy so that we might dwell among or with a holy God. Now, first of all, let's consider how the Lord pointed to these truths in the Old Testament. And uh, we are going to look outside of Leviticus, but we will, of course, uh, pay attention to that. But the first thing, again, in the Old Testament, we see the desire that God has to be with His people. As a matter of fact, we see that everywhere in the Bible. Uh, you and I could not have a relationship with God unless that was His desire, unless He had reached out to us. But that's, of course, exactly what He did. I mean, that's the way that God originally intended it. He made us so that we could have relationship with Him. I mean, He not only made us um, with the ability to have this relationship, in other words, creating us in His image, and I'm thinking here, uh, what we call the natural image of God. We share certain characteristics, certain attributes, certain abilities in common with Him, which are we are spiritual beings. We are thinking beings. We are uh, purposeful beings. That is, we're goal-oriented. And we are also immortal, having made us will never cease to exist by God's will. God gave us these things so that we might know Him, but God also made us willing, and this is another part of the image of God, what we call the moral image of God. He gave us certain desires. We wanted what was right. We wanted what was good. We wanted what was holy, and so we wanted God. You know, God originally put us, and I'm thinking us in the sense of in Adam, uh, in the garden, in the very garden in which He lived so that we could spend time with God and have fellowship together with Him on a regular basis. And the reason is because God wanted to be with us. Now, we know the fall changed all of this. We fell away from God in Adam. And when we did, we didn't lose that natural likeness to God. We, we are still spiritual beings. We have a soul. We can still think, although we don't think as, as we used to. We tend to think wrongly rather than rightly. We still have goals, but those goals are not what they used to be. They used to be God-oriented, and now they're self-oriented. And we still are immortal, which can work against us unless, of course, we trust in the Lord Jesus. We still have those attributes, but the thing, the reason why we don't use them the way we used to is because we lost our moral likeness to Him. We no longer want what He wants. We no longer want to be with Him. Now, thankfully, that change in us did not change God's desire to be with us. And that's what grace and mercy are all about. That's why He redeemed Adam and Eve. That's why He had a relationship with Seth. Why He had a relationship with Noah. And why He warned Noah about the flood that was coming and saved him from that flood and through that flood from a world of people that hated God. It's why he called Abraham from Ur the Chaldees and made his covenant with him and with his children. Why he redeemed Abraham's children from Egypt by Moses and why he had Moses set up the tent in the wilderness and note where the tabernacle was actually set up. It was set up in the very center of the camp with all the tribes organized around. God was at the center among his people. And it's also why the Lord eventually had Solomon build the temple because God wanted to dwell among 
his people. But as I've said, the fall brought a problem. God hadn't changed in his desire. He was still holy, though, but man had changed in his status. Now he was sinful. You know, if there's anything that stands out in the book of Leviticus, I think it is this, the holiness of God. God is holy, and those who dwell with God must be holy. Now, that is why God wants us to do what is right, why he required that his people do what is right, because God is too pure eyes to look upon sin. We read in Leviticus 18, verses 1 through 5, Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the sons of Israel and say to them, I am the Lord your God. You shall not do what is done in the land of Egypt where you lived, nor are you to do what is done in the land of Canaan where I am bringing you. You shall not walk in their statutes. You are to perform my judgments and keep my statutes to live in accord with them. I am the Lord your God. So you shall keep my statutes and my judgments by which a man may live if he does them. I am the Lord. God requires holiness because he is holy. Now the Lord showed them their need of holiness in other ways as well, their need of moral perfection. He showed it to them in the sacrifices, not only the fact that sacrifices needed to be made, we're going to look at that in, in just this next point, but the fact that those sacrifices had to be perfect if the Lord was going to accept them. Moral perfection was pictured through physical perfection. We read in Leviticus 22, verses 18 through 21, Speak to, the, to Aaron and to his sons and to all the sons of Israel and say to them, Any man of the house of Israel or of the aliens in Israel who presents his offering, whether it is any of their votive or any of their freewill offerings which they present to the Lord for a burnt offering for you to be accepted, it must be a male without defect from the cattle, the sheep, or the goats. Whatever has a defect you shall not offer, for it will not be accepted for you. When a man offers a sacrifice of peace offerings to the Lord to fulfill a special vow or for a freewill offering of the herd or of the flock, it must be perfect to be accepted. There shall be no defect in it. Now, the Lord didn't want them just, of course, to get rid of their, you know, their uh, sick and wounded and deformed cattle in, in the sacrifices. He wanted them to give them the best they had. But the fact that they were to be perfect meant that the Lord was pointing them to the idea of perfection. He wanted perfection. That's what holiness is, moral perfection, but it's represented physically. That's also the reason why those who ministered to him as priests also had to be perfect, at least physically perfect. Leviticus 21, 21. No man among the descendants of Aaron, the priest, who has a defect, is to come near to offer the Lord's offerings by fire, since he has a defect. He shall not come near to offer the food of his God. The Lord actually required that those who drew near to him to worship also would be perfect in the sense of being free from certain things like leprosy, skin diseases, discharges that made them unclean, Leviticus 15, 31. Thus you shall keep the sons of Israel separated from their uncleanness so that they will not die in their uncleanness by their defiling my tabernacle that is among them. And, you know, interestingly, this also applied to certain things that they had to eat. There were certain things that they had to eat. They had to eat the clean things and not the unclean things, again, reminding them of the need of holiness, and this really wraps up everything in Leviticus 11, verses 44 through 45. He says, For I am the Lord your God. Consecrate yourselves, therefore, and be holy, for I am holy. And you shall not make, for your, you shall not make yourselves unclean with any of the swarming things that swarm on the earth, for I am the Lord who brought you up from the land of Egypt to be your God. Thus, you shall be holy, for I am holy. 
So here we see really a couple of things. We, we've seen the fact that God wants to dwell with us, but there's a problem. The problem is that we're unholy, and the Lord calls us to be holy. God wanted them to see that unholiness. As a matter of fact, that's what he wanted Isaiah to see regarding himself, which is why he brought him in to that heavenly vision and revealed himself to Isaiah so that he would see it clearly. But thirdly, and thankfully, the Lord provided a way to deal with that unholiness, to deal with man's sin. In the Old Testament, he gave the priesthood who were to offer up sacrifices. Man could offer a substitute for his crimes. The soul that sins shall surely die. If we, were, if, if we fell into that condition, which of course I imagine when you really stop and think about it, especially after the exposition Jesus gives of the law, there must have been many sacrifices brought to the Lord. But those sacrifices would then, the animal would take the place of the person. The man would lay his hands on the animal, confess his sins on it, symbolically transfer the guilt upon the animal, and that animal would die in his place. The animal would shed his blood or its blood in the place of the one who sinned. God gave them various cleansing rituals to remove their uncleanness. And of course, perhaps the greatest example of atonement and what we call substitutionary sacrifice was that national sacrifice that was observed once a year on the Day of Atonement by which the guilt of the nation might be dealt with at one time, placed as it were upon uh, the one goat and the one goat sacrificed and then, of course, confessed also on the other goat, the scapegoat, and it's being released and wandering away into the wilderness, symbolic of the Lord removing the sins of his people from them. Now that was so that God might live among his people. By the way, we do need to note that none of those sacrifices, none of those rituals actually cleansed anyone from their guilt. The author to the Hebrews reminds us of that very thing in Hebrews 10.4. For it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. He goes on to tell them in verses 1 through 3 that these sacrifices merely serve to remind them that they had sin that needed to be dealt with. He says, for the law, since it has only a shadow of the good things to come and not the very form of them, can never, by the same sacrifices which they offer continually year by year, make perfect those who draw near. Otherwise, would they not have ceased to be offered? Because the worshipers, having once been cleansed, would no longer have had consciousness of sins. But in those sacrifices, there is a reminder of sins year by year. So essentially, these sacrifices were meant to provide a kind of holiness, a covenantal holiness to the nation so that God might dwell with them. I think we might see that through these sacrifices, our Lord was looking forward to the Lord Jesus and his sacrifice, and he showed them mercy on the basis of this. And we also know that if the one who was sacrificing the animal actually looked forward to the Messiah who was coming and trusted him, their sins really were forgiven. We, we understand that not everybody in Israel was necessarily saved. As a matter of fact, we find that the vast majority of them uh, on any occasion uh, were, were not. That's one of the reasons why when they came to the edge of the promised land that only, well, actually none were able to enter at that time. They wandered in the wilderness for 40 years and then that second generation uh, went in. Why during the time of Elijah, he thought he was the only one left and yet the Lord still reserved a number to himself. This did not forgive and cleanse and guarantee salvation for the people of Israel, but it did allow God to dwell among a people that were unholy. So, God desires to dwell with his people, but there is this problem of sin, and God provided, at least in the Old Testament, a way that he might dwell with his people through these pictures of what he was going to do to actually deal with that sin uh, in the future. And of course, this brings us to the main point, which is what the Lord was pointing to in the Old Testament, his desire to live with us, the problem of sin, and the provision he made for reconciliation. 
He fulfilled all of these things in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, he sent Jesus into the world. The tabernacle that he set up in the wilderness was really pointing to Jesus. It was like a grand picture of Jesus in every way, even the tabernacle itself. God came into the world and he lived among us in the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what we read in John 1.14. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us and we saw his glory, glory as of the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. That presence of God that was in the Old Testament tabernacle was likely the same person that Isaiah saw on the throne, the Son of God. Remember the one through whom uh, God relates to man, the Father reveals himself to man. We also saw this morning, and I just read in the passage this evening, John writes this, no one has seen God at any time, but then he goes on to say, the only begotten God who is in the bosom of the Father, he has revealed him. Okay, so there is a begotten God who reveals the Father, but there is also someone who is never seen, and that is God. And yet, when Moses entered into the tabernacle, we read in Exodus 33, 11, that he actually spoke with God face to face. But who, with whom was he speaking? No one has seen God at any time. Well, it wasn't the Father. It was the Son of God. This is the one who also came and dwelt among us. The word, as you probably know, in John 1.14, dwelt literally means to pitch a tent. The word tent is actually included in the word. He took on the tent, a tent as it were, which, as Paul reminds us, our tents are only temporary dwellings, which we'll have on for a while, but then when we remove, when they're removed at, at death, we'll put on that permanent dwelling in heaven. Jesus took on the tent of our humanity in order that he might live among us, in order that God might dwell with us. Remember, his name was to be called Emmanuel, which means God with us. So God tabernacles among us. Now, Jesus comes into the world, of course, to do a couple of things. He comes into the world to reveal the holiness of God, even as he did, as we saw this morning, with Isaiah in the temple. Jesus reveals God's holiness, and he does it in two ways. He lifts the law up. He lifts the standard up where it should be because the teachers of Israel had really lowered the standard. And then, of course, he gave us a living example of how we should live. But he did more than that. He also provided the way that we can be reconciled with God. You might say the ministry of Jesus might have created somewhat of a crisis in that our sins are exposed. But Jesus comes to resolve the crisis and to reconcile us with Lord through the sacrifice of himself. The blood of bulls and goats we've already seen in the book of Hebrews could not take away sins, but his blood could take away our sins, which he shed once for all as our great high priest. So Jesus fulfills the tabernacle. Jesus fulfills the sacrifices of the tabernacle. He fulfills the priesthood of the tabernacle. Jesus, that's what the tabernacle was really all about. Remember how Paul says that the law is a tutor, it's a teacher, a schoolmaster to lead us to Christ. The moral law convicts us of sin, but even the, the ceremonial law is a picture of our need of atonement to deal with our guilt. And so it points us to Jesus. And when Jesus died, remember he took and tore the veil of the temple from top to bottom. The veil which the high priest could only pass through once a year. And oftentimes, so well, I don't know how often, but um, there were times when he didn't actually come out because he wasn't properly prepared and standing in the presence of God, he actually died. But, so it was very dangerous to go into the presence of God without an atonement, without something to cover your sins. Well, our Lord Jesus Christ, when he dies, he he tears the veil of the temple from top to bottom to show us that there's no longer this wall of separation between us and God. Now we may come to God through him, through the veil, which he says is his flesh. Now we may enter into God's presence. The tension, the crisis is resolved. Jesus has dealt with sin. And now 
we may dwell with God and God may dwell with us. God came to earth to dwell with us in Christ so that through his work, he might actually dwell within us. You know, we're talking about God's desire to live with his people and he was in the tent among his people, but through the work of Jesus, he now lives in us. We become the temples of God, which is why we are called upon by the Lord to live holy lives. Let me read a couple of things the Apostle Paul says in 1 Corinthians 6, verses 16 through 20, and then from 2 Corinthians. He says, Or do you not know that the one who joins himself to a prostitute is one body with her? For he says, The two shall become one flesh. But the one who joins himself to the Lord is one spirit with him. Flee immorality. Every other sin that a man commits is outside the body, but the immoral man sins against his own body. Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and that you are not your own? For you have been bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body. And then he writes in 2 Corinthians 6, verses 14 through 18, Do not be bound together with unbelievers. For what partnership have righteousness and lawlessness? Or what fellowship has light with darkness? Or what harmony has Christ with Belial? Or what has a, a believer in common with an unbeliever? Or what agreement has the temple of God with idols? For we are the temple of the living God, just as God said, I will dwell in them and walk among them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Therefore, come out from their midst and be separate, says the Lord. And do not touch what is unclean, and I will welcome you, and I will be a father to you, and you shall be sons and daughters to me, says the Lord Almighty. So now through the work of Jesus Christ, we are the temple of God. God dwells within us. We are holy, and so we are to keep ourselves holy there are certain things we may do, certain things we must not do in order to be holy. Holy essentially means being separate from sin and separate to the Lord, separated from the world to His use. We are in the world, but we are not of the world. We are not to be stained by the things of the world. We are to, of course, reach out to the unbelievers, but as far as having really close associations with them, because we're so different that shouldn't really, Paul says, even be a possibility because light and darkness don't mix. Now, this is also why we are to give our lives to Him as a continual act of spiritual worship because we are the temple of God and we are to worship Him with these temples. 1 Peter 2, verses 4 through 5. And coming to him as a living stone which has been rejected by men, but is choice and precious in the sight of God, you also as living stones are being built up as a spiritual house for a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. We're not only the temple of God, we are also his priests within his temple. And as priests, we are to offer sacrifices, not animal sacrifices, but the sacrifice of worship of service to the Lord, of doing His will while we are in this world in order that others might come to know Him. And essentially, that's what He made Isaiah. When He prepares Isaiah through the vision, humbles him, He confesses his sin, his sins are taken away, the Lord then sends him into the world in order to worship Him, in order to offer these spiritual sacrifices, in order to serve Him. And of course, when the Lord is done with us on earth, as apparently he's done with our brother Joseph. He will bring him to heaven, or he's brought him to heaven, and he will bring us to heaven to live with him. And when he's done with this earth, he's going to destroy this, this world that he has created, and he's going to bring the new heavens and the new earth out of that so that we might dwell with him forever in heaven, not just as disembodied spirits, which we will be before that takes place, but in body and soul again together with all who have trusted Him throughout the ages. As a matter of fact, we'll see them when we go to be with Him uh, in heaven.
Now let me just read this one passage from John, uh, this is very encouraging, I should say John, um, Revelation chapter 21, verses 1 through 7. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth passed away, and there is no longer any sea. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, made ready as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is among men, and he will dwell among them, and they shall be his people, and God himself will be among them, and he will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and there will no longer be any death. There will no longer be any mourning or crying or pain. The first things have passed away. And he who sits on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. And he said, Write, for these words are faithful and true. Then he said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give to the one who thirsts from the spring of the water of life without cost. He who overcomes will inherit these things, and I will be his God, and he will be my son. So God's ultimate goal is that we might dwell with him in this new heavens and this new earth forever. So again, the idea is this, the Lord loved us so much and he desired so much to live with us that he was willing to give us his son. He was willing to tabernacle among us in order that he might deal with the problem that separated us so that we might live forever with him in paradise. I'm hoping that we would all, by just considering these things, understand perhaps a little bit more clearly. Uh, so, you know, his love and his mercy and his grace toward us so that we would have an even stronger desire to give to him what his love calls us to give, and that is to be his people, to be his tabernacle, to be his temple, to be those through whom he will do his work, those through whom he will receive glory in this world, those through whom he will uh, basically have the service that he needs in order to build up his kingdom, a life uh, devoted to his glory, his presence in us. That's what that deserves. Well, may the Lord bless his word to our hearing. Let's, let's spend just a moment in prayer and ask the Lord to apply uh, his word uh, to us that we might benefit from it.